Yes, indeed, May West was right. All practicing dentists, at some point in their career, have seen a patient with an acute toothache, and some unlucky ones, including myself, have had the misfortune of experiencing this pain firsthand. But whether you have personally experienced an acute toothache or not, it's important to understand the patient's need for immediate relief. At the outset, I want to emphasize that a proper pulpal and periapical diagnosis is always necessary prior to any emergency treatment. Irreversible pulpitis is often challenging to diagnose due to referred pain phenomenon and a lack of localization. Now, where a clear diagnosis has not been achieved, waiting for symptoms to localize is always the most prudent approach because the symptoms in time will always localize to a tooth. Now, tips for arriving at a sound diagnosis in such cases is critical, but unfortunately it is not within the scope of this video and will not be discussed uh, right now, but it will be the subject of future tutorials. For now, let's just assume that we've already determined the offending tooth and are looking to perform a predictable emergency procedure to relieve the patient's acute pain. Today, we'll talk about an efficient and effective method to achieve pain relief in patients with acute pulpitis. So let's go to the board. Okay, folks, let's take a quick look and see what are some of the ways that we can actually help our patients by doing a quick and efficient emergency procedure. Today's case is a premolar with significant amount of decay in the uh, coronal area, in the interproximal area underneath the composite. And then you have your canal in there. Now, with the diagnosis here is irreversible pulpitis, and there is also a little bit of uh, acute apical periodontitis. What that means is that the inflammation from the decay has entered the pulp, has created pulpitis, and the inflamed um, pulp has moved, um, the inflammation has moved down the pulp towards the apex and is now poured out into the periapical tissues. What happens then is that at that point, the tooth becomes inflamed periapically and any kind of a percussion from the top creates uh, symptoms uh, of chewing and percussion pain for the patient. So there's a pulpal diagnosis based on what's going on in the pulp, and then there is a periapical diagnosis based on what's happening at the apex. In this particular case, the, we have irreversible pulpitis in the pulp and acute apical periodontitis at the apex. Again, as I mentioned before, having a proper diagnosis is a really key thing to do the, the right treatment, and the fact that you know something is irreversible versus reversible is based on two specific criteria. One is if the pain is spontaneous, and um, the other reason is um, the other uh, specific criteria symptom that, that, that means you're having an irreversible pulpitis is if you have a, uh, a lingering pain to uh, thermal stimulus. That means that the pulp is not going to recover from these symptoms. Now, what we would do basically is first remove the decay from the pulp and then get proper access. In cases like this, we have to also inform the patient whether there is a crown lengthening required or not, given how deep the decay is. Um, and uh, once a good tooth structure is reached, an access cavity has been prepared, then you're uh, ready to go with your instrumentation. Now, what's a good instrumentation system to use? Well, you have a number of options. Clearly, rotary instrumentation will be far more efficient than hand instrumentation. And here, I, as you know, I've been an endosequence user, and now I've moved on to a more efficient uh, system, the ESX system. The ESX is basically a more abridged version of the endosequence system with less files. It's basically a two-file system. What allows it to be a two-file system is a number of features including the BT tip, which is the uh, booster tip uh, that guides the file, as well as uh, some of the, uh, the nickel titanium treatment. Anyway, we're not going to get into the, to that. All I guess can say is that ESX is a two-file system. It requires the, the um, getting a file, the expediter file, to the apex first, and then you have a number of finishing files that you can finish, a 25, a 35, a 45, and even a 55. Now, here... For emergency procedures, what I have found out is if you just use the number one file, which is the expediter, get that to your working length, then 
finishing with just the 25 for most of the cases is adequate. It's very quick and you can get, remove the bulk of the tissue out of there and then you just place calcium hydroxide in the tooth and you'd be in good shape. So let's take a look at a clinical case here uh, for this uh, technique. The tooth in question is in a maxillary second premolar. As you can see, lots of decay is present here underneath this old composite filling. And, uh, you know, there's a possibility of crown lengthening. Here we can see the tooth clinically in the mouth. And at higher magnification, you can see that there is a large amount of decay underneath the mesial aspect of this tooth, underneath the old composite filling. Oftentimes, this is due to a lack of flossing as well as a poor restoration. To anesthetize this patient, I use about a carpule, a full carpule of uh, septocaine, articaine uh, in this area. And then it's important to wait a good five minutes or so. And just before I start, I use, again, more articaine, one in 100,000 epinephrine in a interligamentary injection format. And as you can see here, the best kind of interligamentary is one where you see a very good blanching of the tissue. So by waiting five minutes before you give the interligamentary injection, even the one that you end up giving in the paddle area